Okay, our uh, next speaker is uh, Professor Tim Moore. Uh, Tim is a professor and chair in the Department of Geography at McGill University. Tim received the degrees in Geography and Soil Science and has been at McGill since 1971. And he's a fellow of Royal Society of uh, Canada. Team research uh, focus is mainly uh, in the relationship between uh, the soil and environment and also in the last uh, uh, three decades, uh, his research was focused on carbon cycling in peatland and wetlands. Yeah. Thank you, Fred. Thank you very much for the invitation. I feel in a very perilous position here in front of you. First, I'm from Quebec. This is Ontario. <laughs> Secondly, I support the Montreal Canadiens. I hate the Toronto Maple Leaf Leafs. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> and thirdly, I stand between you and your lunch. <laughs> We're already five minutes late, so I feel pressure then to finish. So what you see then is a rather light salad, a very nice green vegetarian salad as a presentation. But I'd be very happy to talk to some of the, about the meaty, gory details behind some of the research a bit later on. So let me finish, first, start rather, first with a, a map by Charles Tarnica, which is a wonderful map which expresses in Canadian context then the distribution and the types of pittons we have in Canada. As you can see, there's a whole, whole broad belt occupied by uh, peatlands through Canada, potentially the boreal region. Also, you can see on the right, uh, Charles has been able to identify the major types of peatlands, fens, bogs, and swamps, which are given different colors here. And also, the density of color then indicates the relative proportion of the landscape that's occupied by these different types of peatland. The important thing is, of course, that these peatlands contain large amounts of carbon, in terms of carbon density, it's kilograms of carbon per square meter. As you can see, again, through this boreal belt, there's a large amount of carbon that's been stored. We also have a great diversity of peatlands. This is a swamp near uh, Montreal, but very similar to the sort of swamps you would find in southern Ontario and through the Maritimes. High water table in the spring, occupied by cover of trees. We also have bogs like this, which is at Merbleur, which I'll get back to later on, near Ottawa. Again, about 75% of that landscape that Charles portrayed is occupied by bogs. This one is fairly free of trees, but many of these bogs are quite uh, treed. In the northern parts, we have these fens, which are fed by groundwater, which is what Jonathan was talking about. And again, they tend to be occupied primarily by sedges rather than by uh, uh, shrubs, as we find further south. And again, as John showed, then this landscape is extremely diverse, with the very strong spatial patterns of bogs and fens and swamps, but also these large pools that occur. Peatlands are defined by the accumulation of organic matter. And therefore, we have this profile on the left, which can go down to five or six meters of poorly decomposed uh, organic matter. And again, they're great preserves archaeologically and also in terms of pollen records because of the slow rates of decomposition of organic matter. And it's important to realize on the wetland day then, the world wetland day, that Canada's very wealthy in terms of the peatlands we have. Here's a table then which shows you for Canada the area in the first column. The peatland area, about 1.1 million square kilometers. It's about 12% of the Canadian landscape. In 2005, when I did this table, there's about 32 million Canadians. And therefore, each of us in the room here owns, in effect, about 35,000 uh, square meters of peat. Three and a half hectares, it's seven football fields, from your point of view. It's richer than the States, richer than Russia, even richer than Finland. Somi is the Russian, it's the Finnish word for peat. In fact, we own about twice per person then the amount of peat that it's the Finns own. Get down to the United Kingdom and Netherlands then, they're very worried about their peatlands, but my God, they've got very little to worry about the size of postage stamps for the most part. So we're rich in these peatlands. Rich, well, wealthy, eh, comes down to money, right? So really, what's the economic wealth of Canadian peat, particularly in terms of its carbon. So follow me through then a little bit of math there. Let's assume that we have about 150 gigatons of carbon stored in these Canadian peatlands. I'll give you the figure for that later on. But it's equivalent to between 15 and 20 years of the rate at which we are burning fossil fuels and producing cement at the present time. So we stored then in the last 5,000, 10,000 years, 15 to 20 years of the current rate at which we're producing carbon into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Peatlands have been a continual sink of carbon dioxide and therefore a cooling influence on the climate in the last 5,000 to 10,000 years. We've got about 35 million uh, population in Canada now. Uh, we own about 4,000 tons of peat each as carbon. Hmm, 
difficult to visualize, difficult to embrace. The current price of carbon in Europe is $10 per tonne. So you do the math, man, we're rich. $40,000 per person in the room of carbon stored in peat. So money in the bank for us. The current carbon accumulation rate of peatlands, as I showed, but later on, is about 20 grams of carbon per square meter per year. And therefore, we do the figures. We accumulating in Canada about 22 million tons per year of carbon. And you do that and divide through by the population. We're actually earning about $6 per person per year. OK, sure. Two cups of coffee in Starbucks. But nevertheless, it's not an insignificant amount of money to try and emphasize the importance economically as well as long-term inheritance of this large store of carbon in these Canadian peatlands. I think it's important we get that message out then to uh, the Canadian public. The carbon balance in peatlands then is shown here into this rather simple cartoon. We take up carbon dioxide first in the plants. About half that is lost back to the atmosphere as autotrophic respiration. The difference is net primary production, the accumulation of plant material. Plants die, senesce, produce litter, and they decompose. They produce three things, carbon dioxide, methane, important greenhouse gas. Also, they produce this DOC, which is dissolved organic carbon, which makes the water draining peatlands often quite brown in color. What's left behind then after that process is the rate at which the carbon accumulates in the profile. The two important controls on this process then of carbon accumulation are going to be firstly in terms of the uh, tissue quality, which is really the inherent ability of tissues to decompose. Sphagnum, for example, is very slow in its decomposition rates, whereas sedges, other materials, decompose quite quickly. As we go down through the profile then, as, oops, excuse me, we then have a lower quality of tissue because we've actually decomposed away most of the easily de decomposable material. The second thing is the creation of a high water table, which creates anoxic conditions, and therefore that slows down the rate at which organic matter decomposes. In general, about the decomposition rate under anaerobic conditions is about 1 20th of the rate under aerobic conditions. So therefore, in peatlands, we've got this tissue quality based upon the vegetation and productivity. And secondly, we've got the decomposition rate partly dependent upon the development of anoxic conditions in the profile. This is a map which shows you then the distribution of peatlands. They're shown in green here globally. Uh, large areas in the North America, similar areas in Europe and uh, Siberia. There are pockets, as uh, Mike mentioned before, of, of large peat deposits in Indonesia. There's also quite a large amount of, if I can get this to work properly, peat that occurs in Patagonia and other parts of the Southern Hemisphere, for example, Australia and New Zealand. The diagram shows you here how recent these peat deposits are. This is the age of the base. And as you can see, most of them have occurred between the last 10,000 years or so. So we're accumulating quite large amounts of carbon in that period of time. We're now beginning to sort of try and collect together this large amount of data collected over many, many decades in the rates at which carbon accumulates in peatlands. This is a map from a paper by Julia Lozell, which shows you again the distribution of peatlands, but also those sites, both in North America and in uh, Europe, and Western Siberia, then which we have a large amount of information about the rates at which carbon is accumulating at the present time. And in some cases, also characteristics of the peat properties to try and produce some overall estimate of what occurs. This is the conclusion of Julie's Lebazel's data set then. Is this is the carbon accumulation rate, which is shown here on the right-hand side, if I can get this right, in terms of grams of carbon per square meter per year over the period of time. These are the number of sites. And what's remarkable is the consistency, the constancy almost, of the rate at which carbon accumulates. It's around about 20 to 30 grams of carbon per square meter per year. These are the variables in terms of the variability, excuse me. But as you can see, it's remarkably consistent. And I, Mike Warrington and others are trying to wonder why is it so consistent that the range of carbon accumulation is quite narrow in, in peatlands. There must be some negative feedback processes which control the carbon accumulation rate. Well, it's important to realize, of course, that nitrogen is difficult to fix from the atmosphere, but nitrogen fixation is very energy demanding. And therefore, in fact, we've got large amounts of nitrogen that's been stored in these peatlands as well. And this bottom graph here then shows you again the nitrogen accumulation rates, which are about 0.5 to 0.6 grams of nitrogen per square meter per year in the old peatlands. It's gone down to about between 0.2 and 0.3 grams of nitrogen per square meter per year. 
show a shift, you'll be interested in this because it's a large amount of nitrogen that's taken out of the atmosphere and stored in these peatlands. It works out to be about 15 gigatons of nitrogen globally. So it's a fairly significant amount of reactive nitrogen that's been stored in these northern peatlands and may, of course, become released if we then burn up these peatlands. These are the estimates then from uh, you in terms of the area. These northern peatlands are about 4,000, sorry, 4 million uh, square kilometers. They range uh, in terms of the, oh, shoot, to me, excuse me, in terms of the amount of uh, carbon, uh, about 500, damn it, 500 uh, gigatons of carbon. And the carbon accumulation rate, again, over the Holocene appears to be about 20 grams of uh, carbon per square meter per year. Tropical peatlands, about one tenth the size. Again, about one tenth of the amount. It's remarkable consistency here. And again, probably somewhat lower rates of carbon accumulation over that Holocene period. And again, for example, the same sort of pattern occurs for the southern peatlands, for example, in Patagonia. Again, a small amount of carbon, but again, the same overall rate at which carbon occurs. So what's going on then? So this is Mayor Blur Bog. Uh, Ottawa is about where that door is on the left-hand side here. It's quite close. It's a large, ombotrophic peatland. It's about 28 square kilometers. Essentially, it's pristine. It's owned by the National Capital Commission, and therefore, they preserve this site. The only real uh, effect has occurred is this, and it may come out very unclearly, there's a drainage ditch here, which was created about 80 years ago. But for the most part, the bog has been unaffected. Therefore, it should be typical of many of the type of peatlands we see then in northern Canada. We have been working this small area here. You can see the boardwalk, actually for about uh, 15 years now, in an attempt to try and understand what controls the overall carbon balance at the Mare peatland. We're doing this through the eddy covariance technique, which is essentially a tower, which contains lots of meteorological instruments, but allows you to actually measure continuously, 24-7, 52 weeks a year, then the fluxes of water, energy, carbon dioxide, and methane that occur in the footprint of the tower. And that's a very powerful record, then, of understanding how these peatlands respond in terms of their carbon exchange to environmental variables. These are the data then for from 1998, 9 when we started, top here, through to 11, 12, we just finished the last year. And what they show you then is the cumulative change in carbon dioxide carbon as seen by the covariance tower at Mare Bluff. We start on the 1st of November, you can see here on the bottom left. And what happens during the winter then? There's no photosynthesis. There's still respiration, decomposition in the peat profile, and therefore we lose slowly a substantial amount of carbon. Around about the middle of April, the plants begin to grow. Firstly, the sphagnum turns on. It doesn't need any heat, really. It says, give me light, and I'll start growing. So therefore, we turn from a source of carbon dioxide to a sink around about the middle of April. And then there's a tremendous uptake during the growing season as the plants begin to grow, they take up carbon dioxide, and as we go down through the uh, seasonal period. Towards, damn it, towards then the end of the summer, around about August and September, we now get plants no longer growing, senescence occurs, of course the peat profile is getting warmer and drier, and therefore producing more carbon dioxide, so we reach a, a value here when the system turns around until around about October, it begins to become, once again, a source of carbon dioxide. What you can see is the tremendous variability. This is the net damn it, ecosystem exchange excuse me, that occurs in this column in terms of grams of carbon per square meter per year. We go from very low values, I'll just point here, minus 10 uptake in one year. In two years, we've got an uptake of 138 grams of carbon. This is supposed to be a natural system. Huge variability from year to year. Obviously, it depends upon many environmental controls, which we try to identify. Methane is an important greenhouse gas, so therefore peatlands produce methane and therefore balance out the accumulation of carbon as carbon dioxide. This is some data then on the average methane flux, for example, from a series of collars that we installed at Merbler. As you can see then, the logarithmic scale on the right here, on the left, I'm sorry, is the cumulative uh, it's a methane flux in milligrams per square meter per day over the growing season. It's very strongly correlated to the position of the water table. The higher the water table, the larger the methane flux. 
It's a log scale, so therefore even small perturbations in the water table will cause major variations in the amount of methane that's being produced. The second driver in that process is species of vegetation. For example, eriophyll or cotton grass, which is shown here, that produces both a substrate, which produces lots of methane in the profile, but also uh, cotton grass contains an arenchyma, which allow methane to be emitted to the atmosphere. And so much of the variability we get in this graph, then, is in fact associated with the presence or absence of eriophyll. What's interesting is that that relationship seems to be quite consistent. Here we have data then, again the methane flux, logarithmic scale, versus the average water table position during the growing season for a whole series of sites in Canada, even Finland and elsewhere, it seems the relationship is remarkably consistent. This line then has a similar slope in all sites. What differs really is the intercept value, really the magnitude, the overall magnitude of the methane flux. Some sites, along here for example, are relatively rich in terms of methane production, and some sites, for example, these at the bottom here, even though the water table might be quite high, are relatively poor in methane emission. Many of the swamp sites in the south, for example, tend to be rather poor in their ability to produce methane. If we know the position of the water table, then we can calculate quite easily what the overall methane emission rate would be. So the question then arises, what are the major limits or threats, if you like, then to this carbon functioning, particularly then the accumulation of carbon that's been seen by Canadian peatlands over the last 5,000 to 10,000 years. So let me go through these very briefly. Firstly, there is the horticultural crops which are produced. Most of the swamps in southern Ontario, southern Quebec have been drained for horticultural uh, crop production, like this huge field of celery, for example, that lowers the water table. It produces no input of fresh organic matter. So therefore, instead of cu accumulating carbon to about 20 or 30 grams per square meter per year, we're now losing carbon of between about 200 and 500 grams of carbon per square meter per year. It means that these swamps that have been drained have a very limited life before they run out of carbon under these conditions. Secondly, we have peat moss harvesting, which I think somebody mentioned before, uh, particularly in Quebec and New Brunswick then. This is an important local economic activity. Again, if you were to fly across the St. Lawrence Lowlands, for example, you'd find these bogs, which have been drained from here, been harvested. They're very large commercial operations, huge amounts of peat being produced, very large areas of bare peat remain. They're very difficult to colonize after the harvesting is finished. So the peat industry then has been involved in some proactive restoration by raising the water table, by, uh, in fact, putting down some fresh peat on the surface as a seed base, also applying as a mulch. And it works in the sense that you're now producing vegetation. Unfortunately, the first plant that comes in, excuse me, is uh, cotton grass, eriophyllum here. That produces a large amount of methane being emitted from the atmosphere, to the atmosphere rather, and therefore is a sort of contrary to the way in which you're trying to accumulate carbon back into the system. What it does produce is a microhabitat then, which is much more favorable to the colonization, for example, of sphagnum, which eventually is the sort of species you want to be able to accumulate carbon in this system. And then the idea is after about 30 or 40 years, you should be able to get back to a system like this one in New Brunswick, where by now you're accumulating carbon at the same sort of rate as accumulated in the old bog system. The beaver, national symbol, I think it's been overlooked in terms of its significance, in terms of creating pigs in Canada. I would argue that most of the pigeons we see in Canada are probably associated in some way with the occurrence of beavers. They raise the water table, they produce that peripheral series of beaver ponds, and therefore they control the hydrology in the peatland itself. So we have this event then at Mayor Blur. Here's the beaver, here's the beaver pond, the dam, and therefore our periphery at Mayor Blur is in fact controlled by the beavers. When we went into Mayor Blur, uh, we didn't realize that in fact the beavers had been taken out by the National Capital Commission. So they were worried, and so they killed our national symbol, the national animal, because they were worried by the beavers coming in and eventually flooding out the whole of the bog and producing a system which was no longer a bog, but rather would be a series of ephemeral ponds. Most of the variation I show you here is not by climate, by precipitation or temperature, but rather in fact is a function of the disappearance and then the reappearance of beavers at Mayor Bluff. 
So these early days, which are the values around here, have fairly low carbon accumulation rates. Those were the times when the peripheral pond was drained, and therefore the overall water table in the bog was low, and therefore we had increased rates of organic matter decomposition. These sites at the bottom here, or years rather, are when the beaver came back. They raised the water table, and therefore they increased the rate at which carbon accumulation occurred in the system. Therefore, the way in which we manage beavers, or don't manage beavers, I think is fairly important in terms of the overall carbon balance of these systems. What's also important? Global change. We know that there is a change in the atmospheric deposition, for example, of nutrients, like, for example, nitrogen four or five-fold increase in atmospheric deposition in the last 200 years. Also, we have pollutants. At Merblow, we've been running a long-term fertilization experiment <coughs> involving then the application of either nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which is the usual experiment to find out the importance of nutrients in the system. But secondly, also nitrogen alone to try and simulate what would happen if we, for example, moved to Europe, where we find larger inputs of atmospheric nitrogen deposition. What happens is we go on the left here, which is the control site, with a fairly low density of shrubs, lots of sphagnum, as you can see, into a site now where the shrubs have won. They've actually wiped out most of the sphagnum. So therefore we find then from the unfertilized to the nitrogen fertilized and to the NPK fertilized, quite strong changes in both the uptake of carbon, the release of carbon, and therefore the overall st storage rate of carbon. What we've seen here is, in fact, the mosses have been lost. That's the major former of peat in the profile. And therefore, we're now seeing that the peat profile is becoming less. We've gone down by about 10 centimeters in the 10 years we've been fertilizing. And therefore, we'd expect to find then an overall loss of carbon accumulation if we increase the nutrient loading in these systems. Excuse me. Lastly, climate change. I put it in red because I think that's the biggest threat of all. It's the one we know least about. Again, we can see changes in precipitation and temperature. They, in turn, would mean that a longer growing season, perhaps higher rates of plant production. They also probably mean a lowered water table, and therefore, again, a greater aerobic zone in the upper part of the profile, enhancing rates of decomposition. And therefore, one can say that probably we might face a threat if we're going to go through this warming of the landscape in the north by two or three degrees centigrade by the end of the century, a fairly major changes in the overall carbon budget. That will occur in the south, but I suspect the south is probably well buffered to that. What is probably more important is what happens to those large carbon stocks in the north, particularly the areas that are underlain by permafrost. This is data from Jennifer Harden, which shows you then the distribution of soil organic carbon pools, kilograms per square meter in the upper one meter. And again, it shows you again in the Canadian constate the large amount of carbon stored in the Hudson Bay Lowlands and the Kenzie Valley, which John was talking about, and the fact that now permafrost is moving northwards. And so I think that what we find is that when you do melt out permafrost, you change the overall balance. This is some data for sites that we had in the Boris experiment in northern, northern Manitoba many years ago, where we have then the pulsar, oh, excuse me, which is frozen, which is here. We have these pockets of thawed peat, little bogs, and also a fen, and again you can find major changes in the overall carbon balance. Now, what happens is they tend to then increase the rate at which organic matter is being lost, at, sorry, methane is being lost to the atmosphere because you're raising the water table in these systems, but also you're changing the amount of carbon that's being accumulated. So what we find, I think, is a series of things. For example, Mike was talking about fire, the aim is a major control on carbon balance, we have the drying of the lakes in the north. We have this melting of the, thermo, the, the thermocast into wet areas, creation, creation of these thermocast lakes. We have this erosional guys being created. Also, we increase the rates of uh, erosion, and therefore we have this retrogressive fall that occurs in the north. So the, probably the biggest challenge for us is to understand how then climate change is likely to change the overall carbon balance of these peatlands. And so I can see you're very, very hungry. So let me go through then the conclusions. I think peatlands pil then have uh, started huge stores amounts of carbon over the last 10,000 years. They've cooled the climate by a considerable amount, like 0.3 or 0.3, degrees centigrade. We have this heritage then to preserve. But also they emit methane, dissolved organic carbon. 
There's a great diversity of peatlands, which is great from our point of view. There's always new things to study, uh, but it means it's often difficult to get to these places and also, therefore, to derive overall conclusions. Uh, Mayor is great to work at because it's really quite close to Montreal, but we hope the results that we produce are representative of bogs across Canada. And I think that the carbon cycling then is under threat from uh, drainage, uh, from peat moss production, from eutrophication and climate change. And I think also in terms of science, the overall net effects are very uncertain because of that diversity that we have and a lack of understanding of peatland ecosystems compared to other ecosystems like forests or grasslands where there's much better ecological information than available. And now it's time for lunch. Okay. <laughs> Okay, very interesting talk. Uh, we have time for a question, if anyone has a question. It's, it's more a comment. I mean, recently in uh, many parts of uh, Northwestern Europe, uh, beavers are, getting, are coming back. So that's good for the carbon trading. Well, it's good, good for carbon accumulation. It's bad for methane. So it's really a trade-off. Remember that carbon accumulation is long-term. Methane's there for a short term, but if you're producing methane, it's not necessarily good from a global warming potential perspective. Rich. Yep. The beavers um, that you described at Maribel, they're, um, they're damming, right? Yep. We're finding a lot of sites in out oh, west, uh, they're actually digging, and instead of wetting up sites, they're actually drying sites out. So they're hooking up catchments, changing export, and therefore water conditions. And uh, uh, why are they digging? I mean, did you ask them why they're digging? I mean, we haven't found any that will answer yet, but we just chase them away. But that's been a bigger problem for us, and especially trying to, to quantify exports is they completely mess their hydrology, but in the opposite direction of what you. But the bee pop population is extremely variable in Canada. <clears throat> I think we've sort of forgotten that as being a major control on what we see in the landscape at the present time is the accumulation over 5,000 years of beaver activity. question okay uh, many thanks to all our speakers for this session yeah it was excellent talks and uh, yeah, you can go to this uh, room beside of this lecture hall and then the lunch will be ready for you okay thanks again for all of our speakers.